so we're going to start um, with the um, key passage that I'm going to go over for this message this morning. And it is Zechariah chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. That's Zechariah chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. When you have it, please say amen. And those who are able will rise to your feet in reverence to the word of God. And it reads thus, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And it reads thus, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are, what are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. Today, if you want to taking notes, you can consider the thought um, where we need to be, and you may be seated. So, all right, let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come before you once again. We pray that you would be in the midst. We pray that you would direct me, and that whatever you have given me to say today, that you would just speak through me, whether those things are on my iPad and in my notes or not. I just pray that you would have your way, that I would be a vessel that you can use. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. And so the title, Where We Need to Be. So one of the hardest parts of life in general is figuring out our over overall direction. And those of us who identify as Christians believe that God is the source of all of our direction in life. We like to believe that when we submit ourselves to God fully, that everything will become clear cut and defined. But scripture teaches us that sometimes serving God can be complicated and confusing. So in order to help us have a better understanding of how to figure out where we need to be, which was the title, we're gonna focus uh, on the story of Zerubbabel. Well, at least this portion of his story. So according to the commentaries, Zerubbabel was a civic leader of Jerusalem, and he had the responsibility of rebuilding the temple after the children of Israel returned from their exile in Babylon. Now I'm just gonna give you some context. You know, We understand, those of you who read scripture a lot, you know that the book of Daniel actually takes place at the beginning of the book Babylonian exile. When the Babylonians would conquer a people, they would take them and then spread them throughout other parts of their empire which is what happened to the children of Israel. But of course, um, after the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians, the children of Israel were allowed to return home. And so you have Zerub Zerubbabel, who was among them who returned home, and he was in a leadership role, and he had the responsibility of trying to organize and rebuild the temple. Because you know, obviously, with the children of Israel being away, the temple had been destroyed. So in those days, that was how they worshiped. They would go to the temple once per year and off give their offerings and things like that. So the temple was a very important part of Jewish customs at that time. Just saying, so in other words, it was very important now that the children of Israel were back that their temple would be in operation again. So this will bring me to my first point, which is that God gave Zerubbabel a job to do just like he gives each and every one of us a job to do. You know, as I just said, God ha gave him, put him in a position of authority such that he was able to like, be the one behind um, the rebuilding of the temple. And in that same way, God has things he's given each and every one of us to do. Now, I personally don't know what God has told every one of you in this room to do, though I know that there's something. But for the purposes of this sermon, I'm gonna focus on the things that I know from my life. 
maybe you'll be able to get some like examples out of that you can apply to your own or you know, think of how they fit your own individual situation and I'm also going to talk about this from the perspective of our ministry your will Christian ministries because I think this is a message that can encourage all of us a bit so when for me when I think back I know that one of the things that I always knew God wanted me to do was get a PhD my mom can attest to this like I was a kid I didn't know what it was going to be in I thought maybe I'd be like a therapist like Fraser Crane or something but I definitely knew that I wanted to get a PhD at some point like from when I was a little kid and plus it helped that we had a Sunday school teacher or Sunday school superintendent who had a PhD so I'm like well of course this is something I want to do this is something that I see God leading me to do and when I finally had a chance to do it, I enrolled in a PhD program that I thought would only take me um, four years. And I even had my own like dream of what my life would be after that. At the end of those four years, I'd be a professor, well, since it was a program, a business program, I'd be a professor at a business school, making a high salary with very little student loan debt. <laughs> um, and of course, conducting research that would make a difference in the world. And I can say that like, people say this about me all the time, I'm a dreamer. Clear cut, I'm a dreamer. Like, there's just no way around it. But I believe, like, in this ministry, all of us at Your World Christian Ministries could be considered dreamers, right? I mean, those of us who have been here from the beginning, you know, we were willing to leave the church where some of us were comfortable, some of us weren't, which is another story, but a lot of us were okay there. And we were willing to leave, you know, because we bought into Pastor Nelson's vision, his idea, as he felt that he was called to plant this ministry we all jumped in with him. And I'm sure that we all came here with our own hopes and dreams of what this ministry would become, of how the process of establishing this particular church would go. But as I'm getting to in my second point, the reality of the call does not always match up with the dream because we find in this portion of scripture that in spite of his best efforts, um, Zerubbabel's best efforts, the temple was not progressing. <laughs> like the temple was not being constructed at the pace that he thought it should have been. The work had stalled. In fact, at that time, it had been several, it had been a few decades and all they had was the foundation of the temple. And you can see how, you know, that could have been frustrating. Now, without getting into all the details of Zerubbabel's particular story, we'll say that he ran into some obstacles when he got back to Jerusalem. Some of those obstacles being that the area was overrun, and some of the obstacles being the people who resided in Jerusalem after the children of Israel were sent into exile. Those being the Samaritans, who, as our pastor said a few weeks ago, we know that they were a race that was formed as a blend of remaining children of Israel who were there and the Assyrians. And it is true that if you read in the previous chapter or just in some other parts of Zerubbabel's life, you'll find that the Samaritans did offer to try to help rebuild the temple, but Zerubbabel's emphasis on the purity of Jews meant that he told them no because the existence of, these, of the Samaritans was proof that the Jews had been disobedient by mixing with other cultures around them. And as a result, the Samaritans became an obstacle for him, which is a part of why you know, things were moving so slowly. But what I want to get from this for all of us is that you know, sometimes in spite of our best efforts, in spite of the best things that we can try to do, things don't go according to the beautiful dream that, you know, we may have had. Like in my case, I did enroll in a PhD program that was gonna take me, that I thought would take me four years. Those four years turned into 11 years and I ended up graduating from a different program than where I started. <laughs> And I know, I mean, like, I don't have to guess this. Like, I know as much as people were, like, encouraging to my face, there were definitely some people that were like, is he ever going to finish? Is he ever going to graduate? Like, what is going on with this? He said he's going to get a PhD, and he's just been in school forever. And so, like, I know what's fun. Truth be told, they weren't the only ones. Sometimes I was wondering, like, did I make a mistake? Did I hear God right? Like, all this struggling can't be for nothing, but I should have just gone to law school. I would have been a corporate lawyer by now making six figures. Like, you know, <laughs> and that's real. So... I know that it was pretty discouraging for me, like in spite of me knowing that getting a PhD was what God wanted me to do, there were a lot of times that I wondered if I'd made the right decision, wondered if I should just try to walk away from it. And, and we can also think of that in terms of this particular ministry. You know, we're coming into our 10th year. And although we have made some progress over the years, I mean, we are in this building. 
at the same time, there are some ways that we may feel like we are exactly where we were when we started 10 years ago. You know, we may get caught up in looking at like other church plants and wondering like, well, this one's been around for five years. They have a thousand members. What's going on? <laughs> like, what is this? You know, or this one opened up a year ago and they have like satellite campuses everywhere. And you hear these stories and it's just like, well, what is it? Like, we've been working hard. <laughs> I know we've been working hard. But this brings me to my third point, which is that sometimes God will use those hard times to remind us of his role in our work. So going back to the scripture, um, the angel said, well, God said to Zerubbabel through the angel that the work would be completed not by power or by might, but by his spirit. And, you know, so even though all Zerubbabel had done by that point essentially was laid a foundation, God made it clear that Zerubbabel would even place a capstone, implying that he would probably finish. Although what I will say is scholars um, debate whether he actually was there when the temple finished. But even if he wasn't, Zerubbabel is completely credited with laying the foundation of this temple that survived for almost 600 years, including throughout the life of Jesus. So yeah, when we read those passages in the New Testament, you know, where Jesus' parents couldn't find him because he was at the temple in Jerusalem, that temple was the one that Zerubbabel built, and that took place almost 500 years after he built it. So just keeping that in mind, that slow beginnings don't really mean much of anything, but except that God wants us to slow down and depend on him. And I know that that can be difficult for us because like, I can say, for me, I, I'm a fighter. My mom would say that. Like, in fact, we could say most of our family are fighters. I mean, those of us who know the story, we're descended from, those of us who are Crenshaws are descended from a man who refused to um, separate his children after his wife's death in spite of being told that that was what was best because those were her dying words, Jack, keep my children together. And as for my grandmother, Dorothy, She's one that on her deathbed was still formidable enough to slap my grandfather in the face when she thought he'd done something wrong. So I'm just saying that we're descended from fighters. Like, you know, we don't meet obstacles without like plowing through them. But sometimes plowing through is not what God wants us to do. In fact, with my experience with my PhD, it seemed like sometimes the harder I tried to plow through, the harder it became. In fact, there was one incident, which I'm sure my wife can attest to because we had just started dating at that point, where I was labeled as passive aggressive by a few of my professors because I felt like they were playing games and I didn't have an issue with saying that I felt like they were playing games. So just saying that sometimes you may want to fight, but as the passage says, not by power or by might, but by his spirit. And sometimes that is not the way the spirit is telling you to go. And so what I can say for all of us here is I know that many of us are hard workers and that were it not for the hard work that a lot of us have been putting through, even the things that we have around us right now wouldn't be happening. Like, I wouldn't be streaming right now on Facebook Live. We wouldn't be in this nice building in the Long Crest section of Philadelphia. We wouldn't have the chairs. We wouldn't have the beautiful painting or all the other work. Shout out to Mr. Leroy right there <laughs> with all your work that you've done here. You know, or the nice grounds work, shout out to Uncle William over there who <laughs> doesn't like any kind of attention and is sitting in the corner. So we all are a church full of hard workers, but it's just saying that ultimately until God wants us to move forward and end up being doing more, we just have to understand that we are still where God has placed us. Like, unless God has told us otherwise, we are exactly where we need to be, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. And I just have one more concluding point, which is that verse 10 refers to like the day of small things. And it's a reminder for us to use those day of small, th the day of small things as preparation. I mean, we understand it in verse 10, it talks about the eyes of God rejoicing at seeing Zerubbabel and the plumb line. What is the plumb line? The plumb line was a device, you think of it as like the string at the tip of a pendulum that was used in order to make sure that things were level particularly making sure that the foundation was set vertical. So just keeping in mind that that was like something that maybe people would have thought, I mean, people knew it was significant and it's very important to make sure that your foundation is clearly vertical when you're making it, but it's also the kind of work that ends up being overlooked. And I believe what this passage was saying is, you know, don't sweat the time of preparation. 
God is still there. God still sees you. God is rejoicing in it. And I believe that just like um, God used Zerubbabel for all those years to make that foundation, God is taking these like small days for us to build the foundation in our lives and in our ministry. Like I can say in my case, the added time in my doctoral pursuits led me to um, attend that fateful conference where in San Diego where Tia and I reconnected. And God knew that I would need her to help me to set that strong foundation so I could build a life that he ordained for me, well, by default, for both of us. So from my perspective, that ended up being a better outcome than what I could have envisioned. Yes, I did finally finish the PhD, a little bit more student loan debt, slightly lower income than I expected, but the foundation is much stronger than it would have been if things had gone the way I thought it would. And as for us in this ministry, we're definitely in the process of building the foundation. It's been 10 years, but we're still the people that this ministry will be built upon later. We're gonna be the people at the front of the history. And what we do now impacts how this ministry will survive later. So remember that, yes, it's been hard work. Hard work takes time. But just remember, in spite of how you feel, if God placed us here, then we're exactly where we need to be. And that's it. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, thank you all. Um,